everybody. Welcome to our 2 o'clock press conference. Um, for anyone who might be listening in through the telephone line, we welcome you there. And we apologize for the uh, difficulties we've been having with the web streaming. We hope you'll be able to follow along with this press conference, at least with the audio. Also, I should mention, um, if you are calling in, the chat function on the web streaming page and the uploading function still work. So we're going to be continuing to welcome you to um, ask questions through the chat and also look for uploads to the filing system there of handouts from press conferences. So this press conference is about, we're calling it Above the Clouds. It's about sprites and elves in the upper atmosphere. And our speakers in the order of speaking are Hans C. Stenbach Nielsen. He's professor of geophysics and associate director of the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in Fairbanks, Alaska, obviously. Um, Matthew C. McCarg, M Matthew G. McCarg, sorry, director of space physics and atmospheric research center at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Academy, Colorado. And our final speaker will be Yukihiro Takahashi. He's the professor, a professor at the Department of Cosmo Sciences at Hokkaido University in Sapporo, Japan. OK. Um, what we are going to talk about here is a unique opportunity that we uh, got on behalf of uh, the Japanese Broadcasting Corporation, NHK. Over the years, we have been working at sprites, uh, looking at sprites uh, uh, which are high well, very fast uh, lightning events in the mesosphere, about 80 kilometers altitude. And it's really surprising, uh, looking back, that they haven't been observed before they actually were. There were some rumors about them up there. Pilots had seen them. But I remember back in uh, the early 90s that no pilot was willing to acknowledge that they saw something up there because that would uh, cast doubt about their uh, mental state and uh, things like, like that. And yet, they are brighter. Technically, you should be able to see them in uh, day broad daylight if they exist, because in high-speed images, they are brighter than the planet Venus, which is the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon. So it's, uh, it's rather surprising that they haven't been seen. The explanation may be that, uh, first of all, they emit most of the optical energy way out in the red, where the human eye is relatively blind. But I have seen them in, uh, in, in out there. But the, uh, and and uh, they are, they're spectacular. But if you just happen to blink, you don't see them. And if you don't know what they are, you may not realize that you actually saw something out there. Because they only last for of the order of 10 milliseconds. And uh, a TV framing rate is 30 milliseconds per frame. So, you know, it is just a very, very brief uh, thing in, in the sky. We have started doing high-speed imaging to get down to the details of uh, the sprites and have been successful in uh, recording sprites up to uh, 16,000 frames a second. And that piqued the interest of NHK. Uh, and they came to, uh, to us uh, two years ago and asked you know, whether they could participate. And we said, oh, yes. Uh, uh, and they would uh, volunteer, get a second airplane so we could uh, do stereo observations of uh, sprites. Well, then uh, it turned out that we were not out last year, uh, last summer. So then they provided two jet airplanes, and we were out there looking, taking sprites at 10,000 frames a second. I'm really impressed with the opportunity that NHK has given us, because not only is it good for science, and Jeff will talk about you know, all the, the various, because we had a very big team uh, associated with, uh, with this uh, uh, campaign, uh, the emphasis uh, was, of course, on the, uh, on the aircraft observations, but we had a lot of ground uh, as well. And what impressed me was that uh, NHK allowed us the free use of the data for uh, scientific purposes prior to the uh, presentation of the program, which is scheduled for sometimes late spring, I understand. But already here at this conference, the HU conference, we have a number of papers 
with uh, data from the mission. And let me uh, uh, just show one uh, 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 little clip that I will present tomorrow afternoon uh, in, in the Sprite session uh, to, with an overview of, of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the campaign and some of the first results. So let me just show, uh, show this one and hopefully it will show up up there. Uh, what, what we are seeing up there is uh, the two fields uh, is, uh, from the two airplanes. They are trailing each other with about 50 kilometers, which means that the sprites there are about 300 kilometers out. So it's sort of like it's uh, out at arm's length from your eyeballs, uh, which is uh, from a 3D uh, filming point of view, the ideal uh, thing to, uh, to um, uh, to have them, and it also turned out to be a very convenient one from uh, from an air traffic control uh, point of view. And I, maybe I should just tell that story that we were we were sitting one night, well, flying in one night in the airplane, and uh, there was violent storms, and we had sprites going on, and we would, well, the storm was over Denver International Airport, which they had to close. So Denver closed, and in the meantime, we are happily up there asking uh, ATC, can we go? T uh, can we get a 10-degree left correction? And in the, in, at, at that time, in, uh, ATC, the air traffic control at Denver, they were busy rerouting all the airplanes, incoming and outgoing airplanes from uh, from Denver. But uh, I, in the back of the airplane, was oblivious uh, to that, and but heard afterwards that uh, well, yeah, they were busy uh, that night. And I really appreciate the, uh, the help and cooperation that we got from, uh, from ATC. Let me play this uh, here again. And uh, the first thing you see there is the so-called ELV. That is the electromagnetic uh, pulse that is uh, reaching the, uh, the ionosphere. And then you see air flow emissions. And when it's going down, it's actually a donut that is expanding horizontally. Then later on, we get the, uh, the sprite, which uh, are going up and down. Um, and then at the end, we see what we call a crawler that is actually coming up from the top of the, uh, of the cloud layer uh, at, uh, at relatively high velocity. The velocities that you see here of, um, well, the, the ELV that we started with uh, is at the speed of light, and, and uh, that has some implication, well, the way that we uh, interpret the data. But now we come to the halo you see here, and then you see uh, the formation of streamers, electrical discharges, and the velocity that you're seeing there are about a tenth of the speed of light. It's very, very, uh, very fast. And then later on, in, uh, we have this crawler, which is another sprite at a lower velocity, but coming up from the, uh, uh, the cloud tops below. We don't quite understand what is going on here, but actually other groups have seen these crawlers connect up to the sprite and, and make an electrical connection all the way uh, to the ionosphere. I was asked to uh, see what, is, uh, what new things are we seeing here, and tomorrow I'll present uh, some where we have uh, connections between the different streamers in, uh, in the, um, in the sprites that actually connect over to other channels. It's showing that when those streamers saw the fast moving uh, luminosity structures moving down, they create a high conductivity channel that allows then a connection from down and all the way up. The implications on that for ionospheric work and for the global electric circuit is uh, at this time not quite, uh, quite known. Maybe I'll just hand it over to, uh, to Jeff to talk about the, uh, the ground base a little bit. Great, thank you very much. My name is Jeff Picard. I uh, work at the Air Force Academy just north of Colorado Springs. And uh, I was privileged to take uh, part this summer in a very exciting campaign. We, as Hans told you, we had two Gulfstream IV aircraft, and we basically flew them in trail, one behind the other, about 20 kilometers apart. And we had high-speed cameras on both airplanes. And from that, we could take simultaneous measurements of the sprites out at a distance. And what this allows us to do is to triangulate and actually get recreate the 3D nature of the streamers, which are the bright spots that you saw in the movie that Hans played. As well as the aircraft measurements, 
uh, we were very lucky in that we uh, managed to find a, a, a very expert team, and we had folks based on the ground. Uh, uh, we also had international collaboration, obviously Professor, uh, Professor Takahashi and his team, as well as uh, uh, some folks, uh, uh, Professor Yair uh, from Israel, and then we had uh, uh, some people from uh, New Mexico Tech down in Socorro, New Mexico, making ground-based measurements, as well as up at uh, Yucca Ridge in uh, Colorado. And then uh, Tom Warner was up in South Dakota, I believe it was Rapid City, yeah. somewhere in South Dakota, I'm sorry. And uh, so we had a wide range of both ground-based and aircraft-based measurements. And uh, as Hans was saying, the reason that this is exciting scientifically is the following. Uh, in the past, on the ground, we have made high-speed measurements of sprites. But always before, those were with one fixed location. And so with that, you can tell the time uh, duration of the sprites. There have also been uh, slow-speed TV rate, 30 or 60 frames a second, triangulation measurements where you can recreate the 3D nature. But never before have we been able to put together high-speed observations that are also stereoscopic. And that's kind of the, the new thing that we brought this summer. Very exciting, very fun to take part in, and I was uh, very pleased to do so. I'll pass it off to my good friend Yuki now. So, um, thank you. So I'm very happy to be here with the uh, excellent researchers in this prize study. So I'm Yukihiro Takahashi from Hokkaido University, Japan. And uh, I want to emphasize the importance of the scientific aspects of the, our measurement. So the, our one, of the, one of our final goal is to determine um, what uh, determines the sprite structures. So the sprites found 20 years ago already, and we did uh, many, many uh, researches. But uh, still, we don't know why the st uh, sprite has uh, so many uh, columns, uh, streamer structures, and uh, why uh, so uh, this has a large displacement from the cloud to ground parent lightning. So to answer these questions, we did the triangulation measurement, on, on not, not only from the ground, but with uh, two airplanes. It's very uh, excellent measurement indeed. So the, in, indeed, we have uh, the one uh, very traditional model, the KSI electric field model, to explain the occurrence of the sprites, but it cannot explain the details yet. So uh, the, we want to uh, know the relationship between the parent lightning characteristics, such as the electromagnetic pulse radiated from the cloud to ground discharge and the cloud to ground current itself which produced a very uh, strong electric field above the thunderstorms. So this is a very unique collaboration between the TV company, a TV program, and the scientific researchers, professional researchers. And uh, this will be uh, the on air in the next com coming year. And uh, I want to uh, introduce a very, very re uh, brief introduction of the, our results. Uh, carried out by our colleagues in Hokkaido University. And uh, Mitsuru Sato will uh, um, show the, the results of the triangulations for the, the sprites like this. The, uh, this is a horizontal distribution of the sprites estimated from the two uh, images taken from the two airplanes. And uh, also the, the, the three-dimensional structures of the st sp sprites like this. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Kudo will present the results, the very clear relationship between the parent lightning mm -hmm. um, uh, charge moment change and uh, the, time delay, uh, the time duration of the optical emissions mm -hmm. estimated from the high-speed cameras. So it's a very clear and new results, I think. And also, I, I will present an out, outline of the relationship between the uh, sprite halos. It's a diffuse structure, appears well above the, the um, streamer structures. So this is uh, the, uh, the diff diffuse structure causes the very sharp streamer structures below it. And like this. So then, uh, for example, uh, we show the, some development of the streamers 
in the, and some point of the enhancement in the diffuse structures point, uh, indicated as the red circle. And from this, the, the streamer structure develops very rapidly. So I want to show the one video, uh, one movie provided from the NHK like this. The, um, the, it's a very short, so taken from the jet airplanes like this. I believe that this is the one of the best shot of the, the Sprite movie in the world. And uh, the, the, I want to say about the, uh, the, the future goal of our study is to establish the uh, global, global electric circuit model, which is proposed uh, almost 100 years ago, but not confirmed yet properly, and which covers the surface, atmosphere, atmosphere, and magnetosphere, which may play, which may play an important role in connecting solar activity and climate, Earth climate. These are uh, investigated in detail based on the, our newest knowledge of TLEs, uh, sprites effects on it. Thank you so much. Okay, I guess. Thank that, you. Uh, Thank you very much. Opening for questions. Is yeah. That I was Gonna, okay, Rick. Rick Lovett, freelance. Uh, I've got two somewhat uh, uh, different um, here. Um, one is what you were just saying about the effects uh, on climate. How, how does this relate to, to anything relating to climate? Uh, uh, the second one, which is uh, uh, simpler, is where were you taking these observations? I'll take a shot at the simple question because I know that one. Uh, our, our two planes flew out of Centennial, Colorado, which is a uh, small airport that's on the south side of Denver. And we ranged all over the Midwest of the United States. I think one night we got almost up to uh, Duluth, Minnesota, but not quite. So it was fairly uh, wide ranging all over the Midwest of the, of the United States. Well, shall I try on the other one? The uh, what is the significance? This is really, uh, to me, a, a very fundamental question. Uh, what, what is the importance of sprites? That, uh, some years ago I was uh, saying, well, you know, is it just like the rainbow? They are pretty to look at but have no further significance. Now, when we look at, uh, at the sprites, there's a lot of energy involved. And uh, as we, uh, we just briefly mentioned, there may be electrical con uh, contact between the low level or the, the cloud cover and the ionosphere, which would affect the global electric uh, field. Whether the, to what extent uh, the global electric field affects climate, I'm not so sure. But if there's a, a connection there, then that means that the uh, sprite activity over the Midwest and the US would have global uh, implications and uh, there may be some, something there. The other thing that uh, has been explored, and, and the, I think it's true to say that the community is highly divided on, on this, that is the chemical uh, effects of sprites. Sprites is a discharge, and you know when, when you have lightning, you smell ozone afterwards. So you're creating new uh, constituents in the atmosphere. And one thing that is uh, intriguing here, we know that uh, there's energy enough to produce NOx, uh, nitrox oxides. And if that is the case, then that would have an effect on the ozone layer. And then we are directly into uh, the climate and, and you know, the in, in, uh, environment. But as I said, uh, the the con uh, community is highly divided on whether this is real or not, and there are papers in the literature that shows, yes, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of this, and there are papers that, no, 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 that, that, uh, that can't be. But, so uh, we, we don't know, but that, that is where, uh, a place where it, I mean, if it affects the ozone layer, then, uh, then, then it's important. I, I want to add some words, okay. So uh, about the cloud coverage, the, uh, the, here the, this is the, the simple um, uh, cartoon of the global circuit. This determines the uh, vertical electric field, 
which is almost 100 volt per meters in the fair weather conditions, which can affect the motion of the aerosols and ions, which in turn determines the production of the cloud particles. So this is only a hypothesis, I know, but uh, one of the very important, I think. I think one final thought on that is the following. Traditionally, tropospheric weather, uh, sorry, the weather that we live here on the ground has been thought to be separated physically from the weather that goes on in space. And that's predominantly because we live down here, the troposphere is up about 15 kilometers, the ionosphere starts more or less around 100 kilometers, and we have this big range in the middle called the mesosphere, which when I went to school sometimes we used to call the ignorosphere because it was thought that not much went on there. Well, this is the area where sprites happen. And it turns out that since we have not been paying attention to them until fairly recently, we didn't understand that there might be something fundamentally different going on in the middle that connects the two regions. And the connection of different regions is always interesting in physics because that allows exchange of energy and momentum and information between them. And so any connection is always fundamentally interesting to go study, and that's one of the reasons we do this. I'm Irene Klotz with uh, Reuters and Discovery Channel News. Um, I wanted to know how you knew where to look for sprites. Did you, was this associated at all with, um, with storms on the ground? And um, uh, we'll start with that. OK, uh, we had extensive uh, ground-based uh, uh, network, uh, the Duke and NLDN, uh, uh, the Duke network, where we, uh, where we have that can, they can pinpoint where lightning activity is on a map. We have that in real time, and when we flew around, before we, uh, we took off from uh, Denver Centennial, we would have been looking at the weather over the Midwest and found that there are some big uh, thunderstorm uh, activity, say, over central Iowa. Then we were looking at that, and they, those uh, big storm complexes, they move relatively slow, 15 miles an hour or something like that. And most of them, some of them, they last well into the night and into you know, all night, so we had plenty of time. So then we would go out and position the airplanes uh, within two or 300 kilometers of the activity. On the airplane, we had uh, two things. We had a Skype connection to Yucca Ridge, where Yor was, uh, was sitting, and Walt Lyons, uh, providing uh, information of weather and trying to guess what, what, where, what the development would be. And on the airplane, we had the NLDN and the Duke um, uh, charge moment maps that uh, really pinpointed where we had lightning activity that would be that would likely uh, produce sprites. So then we, uh, we positioned the airplane and the cameras looking over that uh, direction. And then once we, uh, we saw some sprites, typically sprites will, uh, will come in series. And once we have one, then we just hang on and, and uh, watch there and adjust the uh, airplane track. That's where you know, we are continually asking for 10 or 20 degree uh, course corrections from uh, ATC so that we, uh, we have that active area in our field of, of view. We have, uh, we have proven, we have perfected that uh, technology over 10 years and, and uh, doing, but it works on NLDN, the uh, web-based uh, lightning detection system. And um, what's the best guess as to what is actually causing the sprites in the first place? So the, the basic idea is the following. Uh, you probably know that in thunderstorms, uh, the charge builds up in layers, kind of like pancakes, perhaps, and they're oppositely charged. And it turns out that in a big thunderstorm, you have about as much plus as you do minus. So the thunderstorm overall is neutrally charged. And then you see a lightning bolt, and the lightning bolt connects some of the charge from the cloud down to the ground. And, and in the Midwest of the United States, about nine times out of 10, it actually drains uh, negative charge from uh, the cloud and sends it to the ground. And about one time in 10, it takes positive charge from the cloud and puts it down to the ground. Well, it turns out, I won't bore you with the details, but this is kind of the short version. When you take the positive charge, the one in 10 times, and take it to the ground, the cloud winds up negatively charged. And so as you learned in high school physics, the electric field you know, points towards that, so it points down. 
And you may well know if you've ever scuffed your feet along the floor and snuck up behind your little brother and shocked him on the ear, that's an electrostatic discharge. You've made lightning by charging yourself up and discharging yourself to your brother's earlobe. Similar physics, you get a very large voltage built up between the ionosphere and the cloud, which has now become charged. The electric field gets large enough, and you get a sprite. So more or less, you take some of the charge from the cloud, take it to the ground, you get a large electric field in the middle, bingo, you got a sprite. I, I might just add, that was proposed already in 1923 by C.T.R. Wilson that looked at, uh, at discharges in lightning and then knowing something about the ionosphere and the upper atmosphere, he realized that the electric field at 80 kilometers height or, or thereabout might be large enough to, uh, to uh, break down the, uh, the atmosphere and you have a discharge starting at that uh, altitude. And that's what, what you saw here in, in uh, the video I showed, that it starts up at, uh, at about 70 to 80 kilometers altitude. Oh, so sorry. I go by my middle name, okay. and it's Jeffrey, G E O F F R E Y. Okay, thank you. Yep. And also, can you reconfirm uh, where the mics were taking place? We were talking about earlier, and also what altitude Sure. So the airplanes took off and landed out of a little airport in Denver, Colorado, and we actually flew all over the Midwest of the United States, wherever there were big storms that night, so we were basically thunderstorm chasing. And uh, the, uh, typically one of the reasons we use these particular jets is they fly very high. And uh, so here's a storm track, thank you very much. Uh, so there's uh, a map of the United States on the left. This is an IR shot taken from uh, the satellite, and the blue areas are big storms. How's that sound? And so you can see where the blue areas are. That's where we would want to go fly. And then there's an inset with uh, a track around that big storm where we flew the aircraft. We like to be away from the center so that the sprites aren't too high in the field of view because uh, these aircraft only have limited uh, uh, these aircraft only have limited uh, uh, view angles due to the sizes of the. Uh, uh, around here of the windows. And then we flew about, I don't know, 40, 45,000 feet, something like that, so that we'd be well over all the scud and the clouds and that, uh, that type of thing. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Gulf Stream 5, they're tremendous aircraft, they fly fast. And so we had one of our colleagues, he's sitting in the back of the room, it was his entire job to tell us where to go 10 minutes from now because in 10 minutes you almost eat up half a state. So, you know, you actually have to pay, have one person just say, okay, where are we going to be? Because we're flying somewhere at 400 knots. You know, we'll be somewhere in a while that's quite a ways away from here. And so when we actually do these roundabouts of the storm, that actually takes quite a little bit of work, as you might imagine. You've got two airplanes, ATC, and, you know, it's just a three-ring circus. Uh, Andrew Alden, about.com. I've been following sprites for many years, and the images you showed today are wonderful. I know why you're smiling. Um, one, will we see these on American television at some time? Two, did you get any color images? Um, three, did you capture anything else besides the classic red sprite which you've shown us? Did you catch any blue jets? Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, other we, we did see menagerie? blue jets. So let's see. Well, you, you take it, Hans. That's part of your Well, so, uh, <laughs> we did on the, on the very last day, we did see blue jets, and I'll show some uh, data from that uh, in my presentation tomorrow. And uh, uh, when they were first seen, uh, they, it was guessed that they were associated with violent weather. It was in uh, another uh, jet aircraft observation, but without high speed, and back in the mid-90s, uh, Earl Arkansas, there was golf-sized hail on the, on the ground. So when we uh, saw on the 11th of July this year, saw uh, blue jets coming up. They come up from a very, very isolated uh, area in, in the cloud deck that we're sitting up. We're sitting at 46,000 feet looking out. They come from a very well-defined uh, area. So immediately uh, the curse, well, what is the weather down there? And we have been scurrying around trying to, uh, to get uh, weather information for that area. It was uh, uh, northwest of Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, there was a tremendous storm. I'll show you next, tomorrow the, uh, the next rat uh, 
data from it. And, um, uh, but there was no hail on the ground. There were violent winds, and it was a major, uh, major storm. So we, we're still analyzing uh, uh, this data, and this is really all I can, uh, can say. Uh, you had another question earlier. Oh, oh, on the color, that NHK fielded a, 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 another color uh, camera, and um, I'm sure that they, I'll, I'll show one image uh, from that tomorrow, and I think, uh, hmm. are you having one of the, uh, the high speed? Or the, the, it's, it's, it's not the high speed. But oh, right. that's the, uh, the uh, EMCC, EMCC. EMCC. That's, a, that's a color, uh, color image. So the blue down below is reflection from the clouds of the lightning? And the sprite on the top is more or less red, as you can see. And uh, one of the reasons they're hard to see by the eye, as Hans said, is they're a very, very dark, uh, deep red, and your eye's not very responsive to that color. They also don't last very long. Is there anyone calling in who has a question to ask via phone? Okay, we're not hearing anybody, so we're going to move on to another question from the chat. Yes, the the temporal development is if you see an L, that will be first, and then you will see a halo. Sometimes you get. Uh, sprites that don't have visible halos or elves, but if, if they happen all three times, you'll first see the elf, then the halo, then the streamers for the sprite. Do we have any other questions here in the room? Uh, can, can you just discuss any follow-up research, please? Do you have any plans for follow-up research? What was that? Follow-up research. Well, the, we always have things, of course, we'd like to try and go do. In the past, we've made uh, telescopic observations of sprites from the ground. And uh, it turns out that while we're running fairly fast, these observations this m summer were made at 10,000 frames a second. Uh, I'd actually like to run faster. Uh, you can actually see the streamer tips divide, especially if you're looking at it through a telescope. And that's fundamentally very interesting. Uh, Geez, nobody here probably cares, but how about this? All the scientists just love this. It's really interesting to understand fundamentally what it is that makes the silly streamers divide. And we can actually, if we could frame about three times faster, about 30,000 frames a second, I actually think we should, could start to see some new physics that has been proposed in models before but not actually observed. And so that's one of the things we'd like to try and do, and that's just, you know, trying harder, right? Uh, the airplane observations are really wonderful because you get above all the clouds, and uh, as you might imagine, they're fairly expensive, and so most of the time we make our observations from the ground, on tops of mountains, as a matter of fact. We sit on tops of mountains, and, right? Uh, on, on the splitting issue, we, we were running uh, two years ago at 16,000 frames a second, and the, we would see one streamer split into eight to ten substreamers in a time less than the framing rate. So, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, 80 microseconds. Uh, well, one over 16,000. Uh, 16, so, in order to understand well how that splitting is going on, the details, we would like to time step through the splitting process to see how it develops, we have to go significantly faster than 16,000 frames a second. And then eventually you run out of photons, you run out of light when you are, when you are going that fast. But there we are fortunate that uh, they are as bright as they are. I mean, the streamers, they are brighter in the sky than Venus. So there's lots of light to, uh, light to, uh, to work with. Feet, yes, that's yes. correct. I don't really know. Uh, we see the splitting in, in uh, uh, lab discharges. There's a considerable amount of interest from power companies 
in uh, in discharges how how you can uh, can uh, what happens in electrical discharges philips is a very very big supporter of, of some of that in europe and i'm sure uh, general electric here and, and uh, various industrial um, companies uh, are too that uh, you you see these uh, these splittings in uh, in in the lab and the idea that that i know of is that uh, the streamer head which is very small it uh, it when it uh, when it moves out it starts flattening and then uh, you get instabilities in the head of the streamer that sort of like that rather than uh, than a round bullet type uh, shape you get instabilities and it splits but if we look at that then it should split into uh, to two or three but we are seeing in sprites we see splits up to eight and Ude Ebert in uh, in Holland is working with the Philips group at uh, at Eindhoven actually she's also on faculty at Eindhoven uh, she was saying that they had never seen that in uh, in lab experiments in lab experiments splits would be typically two at the most three and here in uh, some of the data we are at, uh, in the publication phase right now we see uh, splits out to eight or ten in uh, in one split so now what is going on here uh, we're not that far right now. It's just established what, what is actually going on, and then uh, the modelers can uh, can have a go at uh, at trying to understand the the microphysics of it. One one of the interesting things about sprites, I think, is that uh, you know since they happen up at uh, high altitudes, say 75, 80 kilometers, the pressure up there is much reduced, and so uh, the analogy to sprites, uh, as you're used to on the ground, is lightning. Lightning splits, right? You know, you can see uh, lightning bolts that split. And uh, they're fundamentally the similar physics. And the question is, when you change the pressure from what it is down here in the ground to what you find up to 75 kilometers, does it all scale appropriately? And that's one of the things that we're still trying to find out, that we're still making measurements and running models on to try and determine. And I really sort of think the uh, uh, we don't know yet is the, is the frank answer. OK, we have time for one more question. Uh, very straightforward. Um, where can we get copies of the movie? I'm sorry? Can we get copies of the movie and where? Of the sprite? I, I guess, what can I? You, you can, uh, can distribute uh, copies. She's uh, the NHK uh, representative, and she can distribute uh, copies of. Uh, hmm? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Uh, okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, and thanks everyone for being here. We're going to have another press conference at three, and it's going to be.